This week on The Anxious Truth, I'm joined by frequent collaborator OCD specialist Lauren Rosen, and we're each going to give you five anxiety busting tips and concepts. So let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 210 210, recorded in May of 2022. I'm not sure when you're going to be seeing this, but listening, but that's when we recorded it. Today, I am joined by a friend of mine, frequent collaborator, Lauren Rosen. Lauren is a OCD specialist practicing in Southern California. We do a bunch of stuff online together, and I'm proud to have her on the podcast today. We decided that we would do a little bit of a, a top five list. I never do these things, top five this, top three this. But today, Lauren and I are each going to give you five what we like to call anxiety-busting tips and concepts that helped us while we were on the road to recovery from our different anxiety problems. So before we get to that, because it's a really great conversation with Lauren, it always is, I just have a quick reminder for you that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There are three really good anxiety books, books about anxiety and recovery, that you can find on my website at theanxioustruth.com. There's also 209 other podcast episodes that you will all find on my website. There is my free morning newsletter called The Anxious Morning, which you will also find on my website at theanxioustruth.com. And there's just years and years of free social media content, all of my links and ways to follow along are also there. So avail yourself of all the uh, resources, everything is there at theanxioustruth.com. And as always, I will also remind you that if you are enjoying this work, it is helping you in some way, and you would like to find a way to help support it and keep it free of sponsorships and advertisers as it has been so far, all the ways to do that can be found at theanxioustruth.com slash support. It's never required, but always appreciated when you guys do that. So thank you very much. And I'm glad you're back here today. Let's get to the conversation with Lauren. Top five anxiety busting tips and concepts. Here we go. See, I told you she was here. Lauren I... Rosen. <laughs> In the flesh. Well, In the on, flesh. on the podcast. In the digital flesh. Those of you who are just listening, you should watch on YouTube too, because you would see us like where I could actually see Lauren right now. It's amazing. That's... Technology, man. I know it's amazing. You're all the way, you're 3000 miles away and here, here we, we are. are. Up. Thank this you for having me, by the way. Oh yeah. yeah. The internet thing. Yeah, maybe. I was I'll thinking it's just a fed, but it might, it might catch on. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. I, I can't believe that you have not been on the podcast yet. So we've done so much stuff together and I'm like, wait I a minute. Know. I know. Well, I just, I love everything that we get to do together. I love hearing you talk about anxiety. So it's, it's such an honor to be here to talk to you, uh, uh, talk with you about the, these anxiety busting concepts. Top five anxiety busting five. concepts. Five. A little bit click, baby. So what we're, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, so I'm, like I mentioned in the intro, Lauren's going to give like her top five. These are the things that as you were going through your sort of anxiety journey, things that you felt really helped you. Um, they might be concepts, they might be ideas, they might be tips and tricks. Like everybody loves tips and tricks. I don't know if we're going to have many tips and tricks here, but stick with us anyway. I did try to come up with some pithy phrases, but I don't know. They're still, when you unpack them, it's, it's messier than, than just a tip or a, a trick. All right. So let's get cooking. Throw out your, let's go to number one, Lauren's number one top anxiety busting. Well, no, in no particular order. Let's just say there, these are five in no order. All right. I like it. So yeah. the first one that I have is thoughts are not facts. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Should I, do you want me to sort of. Yeah. Let's expound on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, for How sure. How did that help you? Yeah. So when I entered treatment for OCD, I was for the first time in my life exposed to cognitive distortions and a list of them. And I'd gotten my undergraduate degree in psychology too. So I had some awareness of cognitive biases and heuristics and stuff like that. But there was something about looking at this list that I thought, oh my God, I've been listening to my brain and trusting everything that comes up in it as though it were the undisputed truth, which is really weird because <laughs> obviously this is not, this mechanism is not the most reliable by, you know, a lot of people's standards. Yeah, that's true. Let me ask you this. So like you're abiding by your thoughts, like you said, as if they are, this, they are a hundred percent true. I must follow them. They are my thoughts. I had uh, Jen Kirkman on a few episodes back and she told such a good story about her teenage years and her younger years. Now she was literally rehearsing 
gluing herself to her mm-hmm. thoughts without even knowing it. She, she was priming herself to the point where when the thoughts went off the rails, like they will in an anxiety disorder, she was so primed to follow every thought already that mm-hmm. it was just automatic. Oh, of course, these are real. Of course, this is true. That's so interesting. I'm I'm curious. I didn't I haven't heard the episode yet. So yeah, how did, how did she prime though? She just spent so much time identifying with her. It was a really good conversation and I never thought of this before. She spent had spent so much time in her teen years identifying as her emotions. Mm. I'm the angry person. I'm the rebellious person. I'm the deep thinker. I'm the, the that mm. everything that came into her head became part of her identity. And I understand that that's a thing that teenagers will likely do. But really? The way she crystallized that, like, okay, when things went off the rails, she had been rehearsing, gluing herself to her thoughts for yeah. years and years and years. And so wow. the idea that, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that was completely foreign. Boom, like mind blower for me. Totally. Well, and yeah. nobody talks about it. Nope. How is it that you can get to be 20 something years old and nobody's said to you or even more, right? 30 something, 40 something. Nobody said to you, you might want to be suspicious of those things that are happening inside your brain, whether they be thoughts or feelings or what have you, that you might not want to take them at face value. So understanding that what was coming up for me, I, that I wanted to, I I didn't, in addition to recognizing that they weren't facts, what, what the natural extension of that was that I didn't necessarily want to make my choices based on my thoughts or my initial thoughts that I wanted to be skeptical of them and to be thoughtful about how they impacted my behavior, Mm. which was the game changer because for me, because for the longest time I'd take my, take my thoughts really seriously and then just launched into fixing whatever problem they had told me I had. Yeah. Because it seems logical. Like that's what you do. Of course. It is amazing that nobody teaches us that nobody talks about that. I mean, I mean, you know, you you're in the, in that business too. I mean, I have people that are 30, 40, 50 years old that when I, when they hear me say like, you know, your thoughts aren't necessarily important. It's like a, what? (laughs) What do you mean? <laughs> yes, exactly. Because I think most, a lot of people never really consider that that might be a thing. So that's a good, I, I dig it. Thoughts are not facts. What about you? Are we, are we going to exchange? Yeah. Back yeah well, well, I want to hear. Interlace. Yeah, yeah. So my, I think my first one that came to mind this morning when I, when we were talking about this topic is considering the possibility that maybe my anxious thoughts and my anxiety symptoms were wrong. That was, that was a big, it was almost one of the early first steps. Like the idea that, oh, I'm going to have to at least consider that no matter how strong and urgent and scary this is, they, they might be wrong. And, and I found that that was a tough reality to, to confront a little bit. And I think for many people it is like, but they feel so strong. Yeah, but you're going to have to at least begin to consider the possibility that they are wrong. So mm-hmm. my number one you know, anxiety busting concept was at least consider the possibility that those scary thoughts and sensations have actually been feeding you a line of BS. It's possible. So good. And it's really interesting how our first two concepts really overlap a lot. I think, I think all of these are going to overlap a lot, to be honest with you. Totally. Well, and, but I, the idea that it because so many of us before we get into recovery spend a lot of time trying to prove some other concept right in uh, place of the the concept that we're just suggesting could be wrong so all of the churning about like no but that po- couldn't possibly be true as opposed to just saying you know that that could be true but so could this other thing which is subtle but very different yeah. Again, you know, for me, the repeated experiences started to make a difference. Like, well, I've had, this is like heart attack number 700. So I'm going to have to consider the possibility that maybe that's wrong. Yeah. And that was a, that was a bit of a turning point in the beginning, early turning point, but turning point nonetheless. So that was my number one. Mm. What's your number two? Number two for me was that thoughts and thinking were different and that's good. Yeah, which it sounds weird. (laughs) 
(laughs) but I know not to you, but I I think if somebody had told me that a while ago, I'd be like, huh, what? Yeah. Uh, But the idea that thinking is a behavior was so revolutionary to me because especially with OCD, well, and all anxiety, the, the, the thoughts that are popping into your head, you feel so powerless in the face of, and to learn that there's something that you do have control over you, you get to choose whether or not you keep digging for the certainty, you keep digging the hole, or if you put down the shovel and you walk away in spite of the fact that you really want to dig. Um, but in, if you don't know that it's a behavior, if you don't know that you are doing something, you know, then how do you, how do you even begin to consider stopping? No, you don't, you don't know. You don't know. I I try and teach people to just make a single statement of fact, which is, Oh, I'm thinking. And that's it. That's the end of the story. Oh, I'm thinking. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's an act. Stephen Hayes, acceptance, commitment therapy. They talk about the difference between thinking and minding. Mm -hmm. I love that when you're a state of minding, like everybody thinks we all think you don't get to decide not to think, but you can decide not to mind meaning In that context, I believe it's, you know, well, now I'm going to try and make meaning from my thoughts. I'm going to try to solve them. I'm going to try to analyze them and pick them apart and react to them. Like, no, that's minding. So, Mm. yeah, Yeah. it's a very subtle thing, but I like that idea of minding. Like, we don't have to mind, but we do kind of have to think. We don't have a choice. We always think. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I often talk about it as engaging with. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is just, uh, you probably know this given that you're in school for psychology, it, it's sort of psychobabble speak because it's the content and the process and all of that, uh, which is down to, are you engaging with the content of your thoughts or are you engaging with the process and the fact that you are thinking yeah. and same kind of concept that you can be aware of the fact that you're thinking non-judgmentally, mindfully, uh, which is probably what he means, I think, by minding. Yeah, probably. I mean, the minding as a verb, like I'm minding my thoughts. I'm not, anyway, it, it, it's yeah. it's fascinating. We could talk about this for hours, just this. Know. It's you know, so yeah, true. It's, it's really good. So, okay, my number two. The number two on my list was I had to, I had to shut up. I had to shut up. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, and this is going to sound right, but I'm talking about myself, is I had to stop speaking my fear out loud all mm-hmm. the time. I as soon as I felt something, I, I wanted to speak it out loud. I had to speak it to somebody, my safe people, my support people, my, my online forum people. I mean, it was mm. the early days of the internet, but they were there. Um, mm. And I really had to call myself on the carpet for that. Like, hang on a second here. This is not helping me. Mm. What am I accomplishing by actually saying again, what I, what it feels like it's. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that followed after number one, like I had to at least consider the possibility that maybe this was wrong. So if I'm going to at least consider that possibility, then maybe I'm going to have to consider the possibility that I need to shut up. Now, I'm being really harsh, but I, that's what I said to myself. Like, okay, just just be silent. And I had to learn to just allow that feeling and just sit there without necessarily speaking it into the universe again. Yeah. Um, that was a hard habit to break, but that, that made a difference in my recovery in a big way. Uh, yeah. Not speaking it out loud. I mean, every once in a while, we all, we have to, express ourselves. It's okay. I'm not telling anybody to suppress your feelings. But after a while, I had to come to the realization that my feelings are dragging me up and down the street right now. And I'm going to have to put a stop to that. So first, I'm going to stop saying them. Yeah, they're that getting was all of this attention and they, uh, nothing but attention. And attention started with I need to tell somebody, yeah. I need to immediately like go to my safe person, my three people and tell them that my heart is beating really fast, or tell them that mm-hmm. I'm feeling depersonalized. Like, no, I, I have to stop saying I have to stop doing that. Because that's part of the being dragged up and down the street by these totally. things that I think might be wrong. So. Yeah. Well, and I, I wonder too, because you meant you touched on the idea that you, you don't want to suppress feelings. I think right. a lot of people, anxiety or otherwise, do that. Almost uh, want to share everything because of the fear that they're going to sit on something and suppress it and make it worse. It's sort of, do you know, it, it's the yeah. sort of psychological savvy or with quotes of our culture uh, that, well, you can't not express something. And and I think recognizing that there's a difference between feeling and expressing to, you know? Yeah. 
I think in retrospect, I could look back and say, I, I wasn't trying to suppress emotions. I was, I was trying to relate differently to irrational fear. So yeah. the, the, the emotion was always fear. It was always fear. I mean, so, you know, if you're angry or upset or resentful or the, by all means, you got to talk about that stuff. But if you're just afraid again of a thing that is starting to look like it's probably wrong, I had to stop speaking that fear. It was really the fear. In retrospect, I could say I had to stop speaking my fear. Yeah. So that was important. Very. That was my number two. I like it. Yeah. Um, number three. Number three. No, number three on the hit parade. <laughs> uh, certainty is an illusion. And I wasn't even after certainty. I was after confidence was a realization that was really helpful for me because and everyone talks about certainty as the thing that everyone's after, even in our field. I talk about it too. And I think that's the, that's what we think we're after. But when it becomes clear that certainty doesn't exist about anything, if, if we can't all say with definitive certainty that we're not living in a simulation, then there's, <laughs> you can't say anything with certainty, right? <laughs> just, just ask, you know, the creators. You look that up. I well, love that you brought that up. You know, uh, Elon Musk is telling us, uh, and he's uh, way smarter than me. So, uh, so if there's no certainty about that, there's no certainty about anything. But people, what I was after was I thought it was certainty, but I had the the best that I could. I was certain enough from a rational perspective, a million times over. What I didn't have was the emotional experience of confidence. And I wanted that. I wanted to feel, I wanted to feel sure, not to be sure. I mean, if I could be sure, that would be one thing, but I think I understood rationally that I couldn't actually be any more sure than I was, but I wanted to feel that. And yeah. That's really good. So that was the... Wait, so you wanted to do, I thought wanted I wanted to feel confident. Yeah. But you but thought the, that you wanted to feel sure or certain. Right. And that even once I realized that certainty wasn't a thing, because I think at first I was just like, I just want to be sure. And that seems totally reasonable. But then it became clear, well, wait a second. Sure isn't a thing. What is it that I was after? And recognizing that it was, an emotional state of settled and assuredness that I wanted not. And I, I don't even think assured is not a feeling nor is sure, right? Like I, you can't feel sure, but it's the emotional experience of confidence that, that I was looking for. That's good. That's really good. It's kind of deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was looking for confidence, not not necessarily assuredness, because there is no such thing. Yeah, you know, because that's that. Well, we can we can only be sure enough. That's the best we can hope for about anything. Um, I had Sally Winston on the podcast, and she talked about that. Well, you can be. I'm sure enough. Yeah. Hey, I'll see you at four thirty, and we're going to record the podcast. Well, we don't know that. I might get hit by a bus at one thirty. Right. But I'm I'm sure enough to say I'll see you at four thirty. Yeah. That was, you know, so that's good. I just want to be confident in that feeling of being sure enough. Right. That, and we, exactly. And we know that we can't chase feelings. That's not, that's a losing game. So recognizing that I'm after a feeling and also that confidence has nothing to do with certainty. I know a lot of very confident people who are wrong a lot of the time. So recognizing too, like back to thoughts aren't facts, that feelings aren't facts either. And so I could be after this feeling of certainty, but it's kind of a joke anyway, because the, the feeling associated with uncertain, with certainty, confidence, that, that it's a joke because it means nothing. Yeah. It makes sense. All right. That's a, that's a solid one. That's a really good one, actually. So, better <laughs> Thank than mine. You. <laughs> I, I doubt it. I want to hear your number three. <laughs> no, my number three. So my number three was I had to come to grips with, I think some of my misconceptions about me. And believe it or not, that sounds a little bit woo woo and a little bit deeper than just anxiety. But like I would treat myself and I still do an error sometimes treat myself like a machine, like, oh, I'm just I can just machine like everything. But as it turns out, you can't. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, I think for the longest time, I thought that I could somehow just by force of will 
just will my way through this this disordered state and somehow fix it. I don't know what fixing meant, but I just thought that somehow, well, I could just terminate my way through this thing. And I, I had to come to grips with the fact that, no, I, I actually can't do that. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of people would think like, oh, well, you're, you're just going to be like relentlessly doing exposures and going to feel like that's very Terminator-esque. And that did speak to me to a certain extent, but that was different. That was like, oh, no, I have to go into this and feel all the feels and like have all the experiences. I can't just somehow magically. I don't even know how to describe this, but that yeah. I could just iron will this to go away. And that. Uh, yeah. Like there's a button to press, right? Like if we yeah. just uh, press these series of buttons in this time frame, it's going to reset the system and everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And I think for me it was, and it's so weird because I, I can even look back and think I knew there wasn't a button. I knew that I couldn't just somehow like break it and it, that's it. It was gone instantaneously. Yet I still thought that somehow this mindset or this approach to it that I could just will my way through it because I'm, I'm a machine would somehow get me through it without doing the uh, having the actual experiences that I need to have. Mm. And I see on the flip side, I know a lot of people like that in the community, but on the flip side, I see people who feel like if they just hope enough, I wasn't hoping, I thought I could like bend the universe to my will and I was wrong. <laughs> um, but I know a lot of people also feel like if they just hope enough, or they just pray enough, if I just hope enough, somehow it's going to change without me mm. making that change. So I had to learn that it what will enough wasn't enough. I had to actually take some action, which I was willing to do, but it just sounds so complicated. It's hard for me to even put it in words. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that you also have to experience the aftermath of it. Right. I think that's what it, it's not like I can just do the thing and now it's better. It's like, I have to do the thing and I have to experience the, the challenges in order to get better at navigating them versus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I had to actually, it was almost like the tedium of the work, like, oh, I have to actually do this work. Mm. Um, so I think that was a little bit of a, that was number three for me, was coming oh. to that realization that I just, okay, get rid of the machine Terminator will <laughs> bend the universe to your will thing and just go do things now. Yeah. Tiny little things. And they add up and they did. So that was <laughs> my number three. I like it. There you go. That's number four. Number four is that the goal isn't to feel better. It's to feel better. <laughs> we need, see this is where we need bold and italics i know podcast that we can't have i i tried to do the bolds and italics the best as i could with my voice but i will explain even though i know you know what i'm talking about but and not that this concept is mine by any stretch of the imagination it's borrowed but i i think the main idea here is that i wanted so desperately not to feel anxious i wanted to be able, I, I wanted the recipe for how to have no feelings except for the ones I liked forever and ever. I wanted, as Pema Chodron likes to talk about, the dream of constant okayness. That was what I was after. And it was revelatory to me to learn that that wasn't in the cards for anyone. I thought for sure that there were some people out there, even that, you know, if they were people without anxiety disorders who we're just perpetually okay. And mm. I didn't realize that that's not, that's not how it works. Nobody is immune to feelings. And if they think they are, they're probably just trying to suppress them and, you know, machismo up, which doesn't, it doesn't work either. Um, so to, to learn that I could get better at feeling my feelings though, which is the feeling better, like doing a better job of feeling <laughs> uh, and that that would empower me to have a very different experience of my feelings. And that I, I actually in a weird way would feel better because by showing up consistently and being willing to accept all of the feelings in the service of being the person that I wanted to be, I would in effect, breed an ongoing, lasting sense of contentment that would be relatively impervious to the ups and downs of my moment-to-moment -moment emotional experiences. Yeah, that's a great explanation of a, of a cool phrase. Hmm. I, I really wanted to feel better, but I had to learn how to feel better. Yeah. But, uh, the, yeah, the, I think the you did. Of the italics. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job with that. Yeah, yeah. 
we talk all the time about that. The recovery process is about building a new relationship with anxiety and fear, but really about everything we feel. Mm. And in a lot of ways, if you get good at, at relating better to anxiety and fear and irrational fear and those and vulnerability, well, you get better at relating to almost every emotion and every feeling you have. Yeah. Can't help. It. Yeah. And then, and then uh, recovery gets to inform the wellness of your entire life. You end up walking away from recovery in a better position than those who never had to start. I agree a hundred percent. I am in much better shape mentally and emotionally than I otherwise would have been without that experience. Yeah. So, you know, it was a shitty way to have to get that experience. I, yeah. would, I would vote <laughs> for it, but you know, I, I, there were silver linings in it for sure. For so, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Number four, my, my number four, this is a weird one, but you know, my number four top anxiety busting tip was teach other people. Now that might, you know, well, of course he's going to say that. Look what he does. But, <laughs> but that, that was the genesis of that. Like what I discovered, and, and this is probably a function of just the fact that the internet existed. When I really did my recovery work, the internet existed. The first 20 years that I mucked with this nonsense, there was no internet. Mm -hmm. But when I finally got down to brass tacks and started doing the work, the ability to, to sort of listen to other people and see it through different eyes. Yes, we share the same experience, but when I say that I'm pretty sure that I'm about to go crazy or disintegrate because I'm depersonalized, that feels very weighty. But yeah. if you say it, mm. it doesn't not, I don't want to sound like I'm dismissing if somebody else said it, but it's, I don't have an emotional connection to it. I can, I can understand because I feel the same way, but yeah. helping other people or teaching other people, I would find myself all the time. Like, well, I could tell you, I'm pretty sure I could tell you what you, what you should do or tell you what this is. And in that process, it really crystallized for me, like, oh, what would I tell somebody else? Yes. Yes. So I, I, I use that all the time in my recovery. What would I tell somebody else right now? Yeah. 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 Because you have that objectivity. You have that ability to see, oh, but your mind's tricking you with somebody yes. else. Correct. In a way that you don't have the clarity to do with your own mind sometimes. No, we can easily dismiss things that other people say. I mean, not easily, but if, if I run up to you and say something stupid or silly to you, you're going to like shrug your shoulders. Like, What's wrong with this guy? But if you <laughs> have that thought, you might latch onto it and run with it because it's your thought. Yeah. So yeah, for me, the idea, what would I tell someone else to do? And, and believe me, I was, you know, I was at the very beginning stages of this thing that I do, but teach someone else or explain it to someone else was really useful because I would use it on myself. I Absolutely. tell somebody else to do right now. When I did not want to go out the door, I was frozen at the front door. What would I tell somebody to do? Okay, mm -hmm. I guess I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even though it feels terrifying and I'm completely taking a leap by doing so. 100%. I'm just that. And I think that that's down to getting in touch with the rational thoughts, right? Like that's, that's down to thoughts aren't facts as well. Correct. Same, my, same like a lot of overlap there because you can see in somebody else where their thoughts aren't facts, where perhaps you can't necessarily see that as well in your, in yourself. I love that. I love the community piece and teaching others. And it worked out really well. It gave me the ability to look back into my situation, probably with someone else's eyes for a second. That was hugely yeah. helpful. So yeah. that, was my, that was my number four. I was going to ask too, just as a follow-up, did you, do you feel I know I feel, and I've known a lot of people to say that they feel that they're, that by teaching others, by showing up for others, it gives a sense of meaning and purpose to a really harrowing life experience. And um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, completely. People would ask me all the time, like, why do you do this? Why do you do this thing? Now, why am I changing everything and going to grad school at this age? Do you see the gray in my beard? You know, um, to do this thing. Well, because part of it is because it makes me feel like all of that stuff and all those years were not for nothing then. Yeah. And that's, that's a powerful motivator in that. Definitely. Yeah. I agree with that hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Top five. We're up to number five. Wow. Number five. The pressure is on. The pressure is on. <laughs> a good one. This is it. So my last one is basically a Viktor Frankl quote that I've <laughs> reassembled, uh, which the essential parts of it are that I have the power to change my attitude toward things. And while I don't have a lot of power over external circumstances or even some of my internal 
experiences that I get to choose how I show up and I can bring levity. I can bring, um, I can bring curiosity. I can bring, well, and I can also refocus my, I can, I can bring, I can rein my attention into something that matters more to me as opposed to just staring at this thing, like make it go away, which is from this, it's from this place of victimhood. I, like I say that from my own vantage point that I was victimized by my thoughts and feelings until I recognized, oh, wait a second, I, I can show up to this in an, an empowered stance and say, bring it on. Yeah, it's good. Uh, you, you, that's because that's a whole different way. Now you have some agency in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that might make it feel worse when you say bring it on, but, but yeah. I, that's my doing then. Yeah. And it's weird because it's all framing at the, and I could see that I could see, well, I'm going to have the same experience either way. So I might as well do it on my terms and decide that I'm like, I'm actively going to accept that I have experiences all the time that I don't like instead of seeing those experiences and trying to run from them. Yeah. I'm going to have experience. This is going to happen no matter what. So I might as well make it productive. Right. It's, it's a little bit my number five. Where is it? Have, yeah, oh. Very similar, <laughs> very similar. Uh, so I'll throw my number five out there then because it's very similar. It was to me, I used to re repeat in my head quite often when it would get a little bit dicey, it'd be like, look, today there's nothing i can do about today like there's i'm just such a nerd there's 86,400 seconds in a day and i know that because that's a dns zone file expiration number that's <laughs> from technology days but there's 86,400 seconds in every single day and the sun is going to go down and it's going to come up tomorrow morning there's nothing i can do to stop that so mm -hmm. therefore i might as well do the best i can with these 86,400 seconds that, I love that, that. A bit, yeah, a bit of it. Like, there's nothing I can do about it. So I can either choose to live them this way or this way. And right. operationally, it looked the same this way and this way. I know you're not watching a video. You can't tell. <laughs> operationally looked the same, but the outcome was very different. Yeah. I was anxious. I was nervous. I experienced symptoms. I had, you know, those incessant thoughts that kept coming at me over and over and over. So regardless of which way I approached them, they were still there, but the outcome at the end of the day was very different depending yeah. on how I chose to approach it. So very similar, I think. I think we have very similar. Very, yeah. Very. And I, I think to sort of add to what you were saying about there's nothing I can do. There, there are so many things in life about which we can do nothing. And I, I remember somebody explaining it to me in a concrete way and not to compare uh, the challenges of emotional and mental health issues to physical uh, challenges. But somebody said to me, well, what if, what if you lost your limb, right? Like, what if you just lost, you didn't woke up tomorrow and you didn't have your right leg, mm -hmm. you could sit and bemoan the fact that you lost your leg you could stare at it. You could long after it. You could think about how unfair it was that you no longer had this le leg, which, okay, fair. You're like, all of those things are true. It is unfair. It's not like it, it sucks. It would be better if probably, I mean, we can't know that for sure, but probably would be better if all other things were equal. But doing all of those things is just a tremendous waste of time because you still have this day. And so the idea that was proposed to me was, are you going to bemoan the fact that you have only one leg? Or are you going to go out there and live your best one legged life? Even though it might not be the life that you want at the moment. Right. Or the, the life that you think you should have had. Yeah. Yeah. That's right? huge. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I should have an anxiety free, normal, calm, happy day but I yeah. don't have that. So what am I going to do about that? I'm going to live my best anxious life. <laughs> and that's exactly. Yeah. And in the end, that's exactly what it came down to. I'm just going to do the best I can under these circumstances. The one thing that I will say, and I, you know, I'm beginning to suspect that this is true, that the limb analogy is pretty good. 
So when you wake up in the morning and you're missing your leg and you're the first reaction, almost invariably, nobody jumps up and says, I'm just going to go live my best one legged life. It doesn't happen that way. Yeah. You spend some time, you go through that loss and that, oh my God, this is terrible. And I, why did this happen? It's kind of natural to go through that. But absolutely. then you do hit a point where you say, okay, well now what can I do? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I, I think it's fair to recognize, gosh, you know, I wish it were different. It's just how long do you want to spend in the wishing yeah. when it's not going to change the nature of the circumstances. It's, and that's a question for any individual person going to be different. Um, but also, and to that end, I actually, one of my dear friends once said to me with about my anxiety, she said, it, it's like every morning you wake up and you're surprised that you have a left hand. <laughs> it's like every morning, is, what? I have anxiety? Oh that's, my God. <laughs> it's really good. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Surpri surprise. <laughs> it's the same. Right. Surprise. The same yeah. wave I felt every morning. Yeah. Uh, that's really good. <laughs> like you're surprised <laughs> you have a left hand. Uh, but I mean, I think it's the same as if we take it to what we've been talking about. It's the same as waking up every morning again, like reliving and rehashing all of the challenges. Like, I can't believe I have to do this again. Right. Because I have. OCD or I have anxiety. And the reality is that you're going to, you're going to walk through it one way or another and, and getting too lost in, Oh no, it's like this. Oh no, it shouldn't be like this is just the only thing it's doing is detracting from what could be like your, you could pivot and look toward the, the things that you enjoy and cultivate those while the anxiety lives there. I think in the end, we're all doing that. We already, we're already doing it even when we don't know it hmm. because in the end, well, it's another day that I can't do how I can't get through this day, but what you've gotten through every single day that you claim that you can't. So yeah. I think we're all automatically doing it because this is all about shattering that irrationality and bringing reality into the picture like, well, no, I, I, I did live the day yeah. I woke up this morning and how am I going to do today? Just like I do every single day. But, but yet I, I've done that now for 387 days in a row. So I, I, I guess I should probably just accept the fact that I am actually doing it. Yeah. So yeah, there you go, man. I feel like we could have like 200 top anxiety busting we can concepts. Yeah, we can keep totally. Admittedly top five anxiety busting tips was a bit of clickbait. I thought I'm like, oh, I never do anything like this, but it was actually really helpful though, because it took, like I was saying before we started recording, like it, to sort of uh, organize concepts. Like uh, if I yeah. have a five set, what is it? The elevator pitch, 30 seconds to tell somebody. <laughs> what <laughs> about 32 or 33 minutes to tell somebody? And you know, these aren't instant cures. We, we never claim that of course, but they are important concepts. I think you got to, when you can put your brain around them and take them in and, and really start to to buy into them, they, things change. Things can start to change. Absolutely. Even if not as fast as you want, but they can. I think you and I are both living proof of that. Yes, I think we are. I hope we are anyway. I try to be. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming by. We're going to you have to be a regular guest now. Oh, since, okay. <laughs> twist my arm. I love chatting with you. And... Twist my arm. Um, <laughs> we'll have to come up with a new five every every once in a while. Just uh, really. The next top five. Yet another, like Mad Libs. <laughs> Yet another Mad Libs. Um, that's fine. So where can people, I, at this point, I'm hoping that everybody that is watching knows you already, but Lauren, where can people find you if they want to find you? And I will give everybody links to Lauren's stuff at the wrap up also. Well, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I am on Instagram, which is actually where I met Drew. I do a fair amount of advocacy work on there at the obsessive mind. I also have a center, the center for the obsessive mind. I treat people with OCD, anxiety, and eating disorders in Southern California and uh, via the, the interwebs in, in various parts of the world and country as allowed by law. And, uh, yeah, so you can find me and my center on my website, which is the obsessive And I have a podcast that I do with my colleague and dear, dear friend, Kelly Frankie called purely OCD. Well, we just get together and talk about everything OCD. Uh, so that's, I think that's about where people can find me. It's all good stuff. Go check it out if you haven't already. 
Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. So if you come back for the wrap up, I will give you guys all the links and I'll have every, all Lauren's stuff in the show notes for this episode. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I will right, we'll see you next time. Okay, we are back for the wrap up. That is it for episode 210 of The Anxious Truth. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Lauren. I know I did. We're going to have her back on a regular basis. Uh, Lauren and I do a bunch of stuff to, uh, online together. And we're just going to keep kind of ramping that up and doing more and more as we can as time allows. So thank you so much for coming by to listen. If you would like to get at Lauren online, you can find her on Instagram at The Obsessive Mind. Uh, and you can Google Center for the Obsessive Mind to find her website. Uh, but if you want to go to my website at theanxioustruth.com slash 210, that will be the full show notes for this episode. I don't want to make sure to link all of Lauren's stuff on that page. So that is it. That is a wrap for episode 210. You know it's over because music. As usual, that is Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Go check him out. He's a great musician and a good person. Tell him I said hello if you do. And that is it. I appreciate you coming by. I'm going to ask a favor, as I always do, which is if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify or Apple, uh, any place where you can rate or review the podcast, leave a five-star rating, take a second and write a quick review if you enjoy the podcast. It helps other people find it. And that's why we do this to help as many people as we can. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, do all the things. I'm happy to interact with you guys over on YouTube. It's been a whole lot of fun the last few months that I've been doing that. And that's it. Thank you for coming by and spending time with me. I hope that it has been useful. I hope you can incorporate this into your recovery in some way. I will be back next week as usual. I do not know what I'm going to be talking about, but I will be here. So remember, as I always say at the end of every podcast episode, this is the way. This is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're gonna win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance.